A long time ago, in the 1950s, I had a big buddy called Alan. Everybody called him Jim. We both studied advanced level physics, and we did a physics research project together. We went to the same university, Manchester in England, and we shared a flat there together. We'd both intended to study physics, but I changed my mind. I decided to study engineering. Physics seemed to be getting too far away from reality, and I wanted to apply real science, not get lost in what seemed to be unrealistic speculation. I'm very thankful for that decision. The time since then has been very fruitful for engineering and far from fruitful for physics. Jim ended up with an honours degree in physics, working as a freelance computer programmer. He told me there was no future in physics. And that reminds me of an editorial by Professor Art Hobson in Physics and Society. It begins... My friend Greg burst into my office the other day, shaking his head and asking, What are physicists good for, Hobson? Why would anybody want to hire one? Well, of course, they can do a PhD and become academics, teach students to become physicists, and churn out their assigned number of papers every year. And, as we saw in episodes 108 and 111, other people, including other scientists, won't know what they're talking about, but they'll be very impressed anyway. In episode 111, we also met Gregory Chaitin. He told us he's disappointed with the lack of progress in physics, and he's sorry for students entering university to study it. We heard Sabina Hossenfelder telling us much of physics has become values mathematical fiction. And Eric Weinstein telling us the entire story has become a failure. I couldn't help feeling sorry for my friend Jim. If he'd studied computer programming, he might have ended up with a full-time job. In the late 1970s, I spent three years doing applied maths research. Applied maths and theoretical physics are siblings. I was studying a very practical problem. Analysis of non-linear systems, dealing solidly with the real world. I talked to my supervisor about various mathematical problems, including my doubts about Einstein's relativity. He warned me not to go against Einstein Everybody accepts relativity and you will not get anywhere by going against the consensus. But he didn't refute my objections to relativity. It takes me a great deal of time, effort and self-discipline to master a new branch of mathematics. That may not be true for a mathematical genius, but sadly, I'm not one of them. When I see a type of mathematics which deals with fairy tales, like a dozen or so dimensions with some of them rolled up out of sight or compactified, I don't bother to look any further. I just haven't got time to waste. Well, of course, that means that people can quite justifiably dismiss me. Brett, for example, in one of his debates with Spotter Video, notes, Does Dr. Stott think the standard model is not quite correct? He's not qualified to judge. Well, yes. According to the scientific establishment, nobody can comment on any field of the establishment's sacred secular science without a PhD in that field. It wasn't always like that. Michael Faraday didn't even have a matriculation certificate, but in his day, anyone was welcome to make comments 
on any branch of science, and it was up to the hearers to decide whether what he said seemed reasonable or not. In another comment to Spotter, Brett tells us, It's regrettable that you see ridicule or personal attacks in what I wrote. Every word bears directly on Dr. Stott's ability to evaluate the frontiers of quantum mechanics, just as you asked. If someone does not have the training, does not know the field, does not have the math, is not familiar with the body of evidence and cannot think clearly or express their ideas, objections or reservations, they simply cannot participate at a professional level. Well, yes, but I didn't claim to participate at a professional level. I certainly don't have the maths relating to quantum mechanics. I don't think quantum mechanics is based on an understanding of reality, or even an attempt to understand reality. So why should I waste my time learning its baffling brand of mathematics? After all, I see far more chance of approaching reality at the subatomic level with stochastic electrodynamics. I see value in trying to understand the creation that the creator actually created by a reasonable evaluation of possibilities rather than by accepting what appears to be nothing but an abstruse mathematical recipe. Going a little further in his discussion with Spotter, Brett tells us, Dr. Stott doesn't understand first semester statistics. Now, that came up because Brett pointed out that astronomical results are usually given with the precision of so many standard deviations. I wasn't impressed and told him that didn't mean very much unless you know the probability density function. Well, Brett knows a lot about maths, so I expected he'd understand what I was talking about. Apparently he didn't, so I suspect that others might also need a bit of explanation. And probability is a very important part of anything to do with creation, since we can't go back and see what actually happened. So it's worth finding out a bit about it. First, what is a probability density function? It's a diagram showing how some measure, for example length, of a large set of samples is distributed. The set of all the values is called a data set. The most commonly used probability density function is called a normal distribution. Almost all texts on probability tell us it's a very common distribution which is valid for many questions like the size of fish in a stream or the intelligence of a large group of people. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it's obvious why it would be nice if it were true. The normal distribution is easy to work with. A probability density function has some properties called locations. The locations are the mean, the numerical average of all the samples, the mode, the most common value of all the samples, usually the peak value, the median, the value which has half of the measured values above it and half of the values below it. And the mid-range, which is halfway between the largest and the smallest value. In a normal distribution, all are at the same place. There are other properties called variance, standard deviation, and coefficient of variation, which are measures of the spread of the distribution. Until about 15 years ago, I didn't concern myself much with statistics. I used a few statistical tests like the student's t-test 
I had an occasional brush with Gumball Maximum and Gumball Minimum distributions for estimating things like severe wind loading, maximum and minimum water reservoir levels and such things. But a few years ago, I was asked to assess a large number of structural failures due to expansive soils. All of those failing buildings had been designed according to accepted practice. They shouldn't have failed. I looked for solutions. Expansive soils had been a very high-profile problem. In America, Australia, South Africa and several other countries, more financial damage is caused to buildings and infrastructure by expansive soils than by any other cause, including earthquakes, floods and hurricanes. The top expert was a Canadian professor. I studied many of his papers. But at a prestigious invited lecture in the question time, he admitted he'd given up trying to solve the problem of expansive soils. It was, as he put it, a bad problem, and if you get involved, you lose money. I kept searching. I attended a workshop given by the world's top expert on reliability-based design, which is squarely founded on probabilities. A log-normal distribution is assumed for soil properties. The reason didn't strike me as compelling. So I asked Professor Poon why it was assumed, not measured. He told me it would take 636 tests to verify the distribution to the required confidence level. The most highly esteemed soil tests are very expensive and just one test can take several weeks. Even the ordinary tests require expensive sampling and laboratory testing, which would take an unacceptably long time at an unacceptable cost. So I devised methods to test a very large number of samples in a reasonable time frame. None of the resulting probability density functions look like the accepted log-normal curve. Some were not very far off, but some were bimodal, with two peaks. And it was impossible to tell, just by looking at the soil, what kind of distribution it would have. The mathematical statistics, which I'd been taught, didn't help at all. So I turned to a far more relevant and useful tool known as exploratory data analysis. Instead of guessing at a probability density function and seeing how well observations can fit into it, you try to find out what the data is trying to tell you. And the first thing is to see if the data is actually meaningful. Does it represent data with constant parameters? Is there any kind of autocorrelation or other fatal flaw? And you do that before you waste your time on something that may just mislead you. My research students and I have largely lost faith in mathematical statistics. The department where we do our research is turning towards exploratory data analysis. But I expect that those who deal with things too far away to actually get their hands on Things having no real consequence for anything except the papers they write would be quite happy to carry on assuming a favourable distribution and thinking it unreasonable to raise any questions or doubts. I drew up probability density functions for soils from many construction sites in South Africa and Lesotho enough to test out well-known probability strategies like Bayesian analysis and Pearson's multi-moment analysis. Many of the distributions were so far from a normal type of distribution that these methods could give totally misleading results. And for some distributions, 
even the usual terminology doesn't really fit. For this distribution, from a housing development in Maseru, Lesotho, is there even a meaningful location? The mean, median and mid-range are in the middle of nowhere. But there are three candidates for the mode. And what about the standard deviation, which is a distance from the mean? On one side, we have a tiny minimum value, and the other side, a large maximum value. What significance or meaning does standard deviation have here? All of these soils are assumed in the codes of practice to have a log normal distribution. I think this shows how easy it is for us to make assumptions that seem very reasonable, but are actually just plain wrong. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.